This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life can be very difficult at times. As listeners of this podcast, you may know that life's problems can often feel insurmountable, and it's not uncommon to feel alone and at odds with yourself. However, you don't have to handle life's twists and turns alone. BetterHelp Online Therapy is there for you. They will assess your needs and recommend a licensed professional therapist specializing in your specific care needs within 48 hours hours. I live in New York City, which is the epicenter of therapy, and I've seen it work wonders for many of my friends and colleagues. But even in a big city, it can be difficult to get an appointment with a therapist, sometimes taking weeks or even months. BetterHelp is always accessible. You're never left with outrageous waiting periods. If your therapist isn't the right fit, you can easily switch. BetterHelp is not a crisis hotline. It's not self-help. It's professional online therapy that is secure and available worldwide. BetterHelp is a great way to invest in yourself, and they have a special offer for my listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Nick Bryant. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash Nick Bryant. Paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. everybody, welcome to the Nick Bryant Podcast. Today, my guest is Ewan White. Ewan, how are you doing? Oh, I'm very good, and you? I'm good. I came across an article that Ewan had written in Toronto Life about his growing up, and it reminded me of, we had certain parallels growing up, and I will... Um, I'll, I'll riff on some of my parallels with Ewan as, as we get into, uh, into his story. So could you tell me a little bit about yourself, Ewan? Yeah, no, I've written, written four books, uh, literary criticism, art criticism, uh, art, contemporary art in, in particular. Um, also, I've you know, written poetry uh, and a translation of the Roman poet Catullus. The article that you wrote in Toronto Life was called The Cult That Raised Me. Could you describe that cult a little bit? Yeah, it was uh, sort of your, um, it, it was this sort of the charismatic Christian renewal, which sort of, in, I mean, would have its roots maybe back in the 1950s, uh, but hit very strongly uh, as a reaction to the hippie movement, it, it appears. Um, and you, so you have the very conservative American religious groups uh, reacting towards the, those movements. And, and you know, white Christian nationalism is also uh, part of it. This group, um, they didn't really come up with any of their ideas themselves. Uh, they copied literally everything from a German cult uh, called the Evangelical Sisterhood of Mary in Darmstadt, Germany. And that, uh, that cult uh, came out of the ashes of World War II, started in 1947. But uh, its leader, uh, 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 Basileia Schlink, called, called self-styled Mother Basileia, um, she... Uh, it, she was actually interrogated by the Gestapo. Uh, the claim is two occasions. I've gone through the academic papers on this. And she, she uh, it appears that part of the interrogation technique that they use to get people to comply 
may have been associated with that general um, the general ethos of the uh, the brown shirt period in Germany uh, so during the Second World War, and uh, so in in Darmstadt they called the uh, Lichtgemeinschaften uh, communities of light, and they would interrogate people. Um, and, but, but a very calculated kind of gaslighting interrogation. And uh, it's very, very successful um, in getting people to comply. You can get an ordinary person and um, over a period of not that long, you get them behaving in ways they normally wouldn't behave. And then they could, uh, could end up doing very horrible things to uh, other people. But it, th they trained the community of Jesus, the American cult, uh, they, they, the Americans came over, Kay uh, Anderson and Judy Sorensen, uh, the founders of the community of Jesus cult, they came over to Darmstadt in the late 60s. Um, and uh, they, they actually um, got the German cult leaders to go over to Cape Cod to help them found their own cult. The community of Jesus was originally called the Little Sisters of Mary. Um, in fact, and so it's essentially uh, a kind of micro copy of Darmstadt, Germany, and they translated the words light session or Lichtgemeinschaft into light session and this uh, gaslighting uh, interrogation technique uh, where we have uh, accounts where Basilea said you shouldn't do this on children and you can't run a monastic community. They were trying to imitate a medieval mon monastic community. They said you can't uh, do that with children and Kay and Judy said, well, we're gonna do it anyway. So they did it with families. And so these techniques were used on children, which was incredibly damaging. And the, the American cult in the mid seventies uh, managed to, you know, some accounts say got complete control, certainly uh, a very dominant influence on a boarding school called Granville Christian College and in Brockville, Canada. And they um, essentially all the members, the staff members were members of the community of Jesus cult and they would go down to the cult uh, for religious training and training and these light sessions. And these techniques were, were used on the children there, not just in the community of Jesus cult proper in Orleans, Massachusetts, Cape Cod, but in Grenville Christian College. They would, use, they would use it on some of the paying students, but it was a divide. Some people would get like a clean ride. Other people would be uh, treated horrifically, very abusively. And so that's sort of the outline of it. And this went on through the, the 70s, the 80s, and, and into the 90s, and the, the school uh, closed in the, to the, I think it was 2007. Um, but it was multiple counts of abuse. There were, there were rapes, um, you know, and the, the, the staff would do nothing. And the police, the provincial police of the province of Ontario would bring the students back. And it's questionable whether it was legal because they bring back 16 year olds, which I believe you are allowed to leave uh, at 60, but they would do this anyway. So the, uh, the cult was founded by two American housewives, Kay Anderson and Judy Sorensen and they became known as the mothers. And these mothers weren't the mothers of invention. They were the antithesis of the mothers of invention. Tell us a little bit about the mothers. Yeah, the mothers of uh, a Piganaic copy. Uh, they did nothing original. You know, I, it, you know, Kay Anderson was notoriously racist. She didn't like Abraham Lincoln and his legacy because of uh, of uh, stopping slavery, and she was openly racist. Um, there are there are some in some of the affidavits I've been collecting because I've been researching this cult for uh, quite a number of years. Um, the racist comments of Judy Sorensen are incredible. I've also uh, witnessed to uh, a lot of this as well. It's it's they were uh, very kind of backward looking. And they hid their, their lesbian affair from the, the community of Jesus members. Like people were absolutely shocked to find out that they were a lesbian couple uh, years afterwards. What's interesting about that is you've kind of got the J. Edgar Hoover dynamic. 
um, where someone is in the closet and they hate themselves so much because they're in their closet, they're going to unleash as much suffering and anguish as possible. And actually, I read an account in your article where one of the mothers had a revelation, um, a divine inspired revelation that members of the community were not to have oral sex. Meanwhile, uh, the mothers were going at it pretty hard. And uh, that kind of hypocrisy always emerges um, or often emerges in religious institutions. The, the hypocrisy is just, it, it's over the top. And the, the underlings, uh, the sort of lower level people in, in the cult and the, the people who were very much the followers at, at Grenville, also members of the cult, um, they, uh, you know, they, I, I don't think a lot of them, a lot, a lot of them were trying to be sincere, but they would go along with all sorts of abuse of, of children and they're very weak. And uh, it's, it's incredible to see that even years afterwards, it's very hard for them to even uh, admit to this. Like just, they created such weak followers. It's, it's just incredible. It's incredible and they were able to manipulate and they're able to to uh live this kind of medieval on the top of this medieval fiefdom and they, they had a like a, an estate in bermuda a private plane i think at one point they had their own pilot um you know and they they get a flat in in england where they would have uh they had this this idea of marketing themselves as uh with their music programs, so they would they would legitimize them, and they ended up with associations with this prominent Gregorian chant um, teacher, uh, Mary Berry, who is also I mean, if she had known Mary Berry had known what was going on, uh, you got to wonder you wonder what she would have thought. But it, it was very well hidden, and as long with the the excessive child abuse uh, and child sexual abuse at the Community of Jesus. I uh, was doing a little background on this and I came across an article, The Community of Jesus or an Upper Class Episcopalian Jonestown. And um, I'm glad you didn't have to drink any Kool-Aid. The school that you talked about, uh, Grenville Christian Academy, your first encounter was oh, with the uh, headmaster, Charles Farnsworth. And in your article, you say, Headmaster Charles Fonsworth responded by proudly telling us about his experience beating children. He spoke of it with a sense of delight, explaining how he whipped his own sons with a belt and how good it was for them. So the headmaster is obviously a sadist towards children. And I imagine that would uh, trickle down amongst the staff. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. and and. You know that they, they would kind of groom um, sadists. There was one one guy, um, you know, Dan Ortolotti is the guy's name, and he he shows up constantly in accounts of uh, abusing, like physically abusing uh, students there. And he he apparently was a was a member, went to school there apparently, and then he ended up being uh, basically the head beater one of the head beaters of, of children there. And it appeared he, he really, really enjoyed this. And it appeared, he, I mean, he was according, I mean, I have an account. I have, I have some of the, uh, the writing of uh, Charles Farnsworth, which was previously not, um, well, I think I have the only copy, but at any, any rate, um, he, he, th there were talks of how this guy was allegedly saved, brought into Grenville, and he became this incredible beast. And whatever the personal backgrounds of this guy was to start, it must have been, must have been pretty horrific. But what he did to children is unconscionable. The, the fact that this guy is not in jail is is a uh, is a just shows the weakness of our of our legal system. Well, Canada, like the United States, uh, pays a great deal of lip service to children as its most precious resource, resource, but it obviously 
in a lot of cases, we don't see it putting its money or its laws towards the protection of children. So the mothers, they felt that the children should be severed from their parents. The mothers called parental love idolatry, the sin of loving anybody or anything aside from God, because they believe it made parents blind to their children's transgressions. So the goal was to segregate you from your parents, which is definitely a, a cult technique. Oh, absolutely. And you were, you were, you were told that, uh, you know, like a lot of the, the paying students who told their parents were, you know, of the world, in some cases, they would call them evil, a whole variety of derogatory terms, and they would try to damage the relationships uh, with the parents. And a lot of these students would end up in the community of Jesus cult. Um, so if you go to the community of Jesus, and you're to pull around, you'll find a very high percentage of people would have gone to Grenville Christian College. And, you know, some of them would have been like these, you know, people who would never have even heard of the community of Jesus, but because they went to Grenville, they were scooped and they ended up in the community of Jesus cult, of which I would add that there's not a single black person uh, when I was there in 2019, not a single black member in their uh, claim 275 or so members. You know, they, they, it's, uh, they're incredibly racist, just incredibly racist. And they're founded by racists. It is, it is the white Christian nationalist uh, style of cult. The mothers claimed to quote, see things in the spirit about people or a situation. And God was directly talking to them and because of that, because of their revelation, the kids were subjected to light sessions. Could, could you describe a light session? Um, it, you know, it's, it's hard to describe um, to people, sort of ordinary people in society. It, it's, it's a very intense gaslighting um, sort of interrogation. And there's always the threat of violence. And, you know, <clears throat> because of that, sometimes they'd be interrupted and then they'd beat, beat the children and bring them back. And it, it, you just to bring people in line and to make you, it's like newspeak almost of, uh, you know, so it's, it's Orwellian kind of, like you can, you can force somebody by, especially young children. Uh, and it was to force them to get in line with the cult, but ultimately, they wanted your allegiance to the cult leaders above parents. It's kind of similar to the, uh, you know, the Soviet era where they would, uh, uh, you know, they would have children telling on parents and this type of thing. There was a word for it, something ecritio. It's, it's very similar uh, to the worst part of that era. And it's that style, but it was streamlined by the Germans. And it, it was very, and the light sessions would, would be, incredibly upsetting for adults. The accounts at the evangelical sisterhood of adults who went in there, their accounts are, it's heartbreaking reading the accounts. And, um, and the community of Jesus, I think, I mean, you know, was equally savage, I think probably worse, uh, bad enough for the adults. You, 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 it's, there's so many accounts of this on record. Uh, but to children, I think the damage is irreparable. I, I don't think you can go through these experiences sustained over years and expect to have a normal life or a, a, a normal uh, somewhere within, within the parameters of normal like self-esteem relationship to the self and the self-esteem. It's gonna be very difficult for children who have gone through that because it, it, an in light session would go, it, it'd be very intense. Sometimes, you know, they, they could be short but often they'd be long to get you to completely uh, submit to them. I remember uh, at one point in a light session uh, where I was convinced, you know, I'd, I'd seen a cat run across the road and they had me convinced that it didn't run across the road. Like, and I would be convinced, well, I didn't see that. It didn't run across the road. They could convince, like, and, and you're a child. I mean, you're, you're eight, nine, 10, 11 year old child. You know, I mean, and, and of course, I mean, it was my entire childhood. I was at the community just for like a long time. This was basically my, and the 
Grenville. It was my childhood, like age eight to 16. And the, the, these light sessions were, uh, I, it doesn't sound like much, but they were, they were pretty intense, pretty intense. Sometimes they would, they would go on for hours. And, and with a tremendous amount of physical abuse with these. Oh, yeah, there was, there's physical abuse for sure. For sure. Um, some of the affidavits that I've collected, the, the accounts, one I was actually a witness to. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's witness a lot more than one, but, but one of the ones that the, uh, actually uh, an American uh, minister wrote. Um, and I actually was witness to this. Uh, it was a pretty severe abuse on a 15 year old boy. And uh, what can you say? What can you say that this, that's how that cult really is and that's how they treat children and and i guess in the united states to a certain extent or maybe lesser extent in canada whatever somebody if somebody claims something is their religion well it, that would trump any sort of child rights um the level of abuse in your article you've got one account of headmaster farnsworth the disciplinarian administering light sessions without any clothes while he was nude, which uh, sounds like a, a very horrific reality. Um, well, the students would, some of the students would be nude. Yeah, light session nude. But uh, they would come into the shower, um, you know, yeah, they'd come into the shower and, oh, okay. you know, be like, but, but uh, I, I mean, th that was, um, that was a, a different student where he would be, you know what, I'm not, you know, everything went down at Grenville, so and it, nothing would surprise me. But the, yeah, there was, there was, a, there was a abuse to, to nude students, for sure, for sure. And you'd be completely vulnerable in that situation. And despite this, terrible abuse, Granville Academy and also the community of Jesus. Granville Christian College. Granville Christian College attracted a lot of very successful, powerful people. Three successive lieutenant governors of Ontario um, sat on the school's board and a number of affluent people were part of the community. So it gave it a veneer of respectability to have these affluent people um, coming to the school and taking part in the school and taking part in the community. At one point, did you say this is not right? I mean, you must've been brainwashed at a certain point. And at some point, did you say this is not right? Or how did, how did you psychically decide to split from that community and that school for that matter? Well, I mean, as, as a young child, when I first uh, was dropped off and separated, uh, you know, from my parents, I knew this was not right. But it, I was brainwashed, um, you know, like most of the other children. It, uh, and I was very young. And, uh, but some, I don't know, part of me all along was just waiting for a moment to get out of there. I, uh, it, 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 yeah, I mean, like part of me would, it was like a divided self where part of me was uh, trying to go along with it to avoid uh, even more abuse. And the other part of me was, how can I hang on to my sense of self? And, just not lose myself to this, this collective juggernaut cult. Was there a point where you just said, these people are crazy? Oh, I was thinking they're crazy uh, all along. But yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I, I think because of how much violence I experienced, when I was very young, that part of me was just, okay, like, I just have to, I just have to ride this out. Like, the, you know, um, you know, I had my head smashed on the floor by one of the cult, uh, adult cult members, well, with two other 
adult members joining in uh, and forced to eat my own vomit uh, as a young child at the community of Jesus. And it's just like, and this happened a, a number of times. So uh, there was a weird issue with eating and that place. Also Kay and Judy, you know, they would excessively overweight people. Um, and they, there was a, e eating was a big issue with them as well. That's that's a bit of a side, maybe to come back to. But I, I just uh, part of me never bought into the whole thing. But yeah, it it creates divided cells when you're in there, and it, it's hard to sort of find yourself. You talk about an inner voice; you can easily lose track of that uh, as a child. And I think a lot of people never recover. Uh, I feel very badly for the, a lot of these, you know, the people who had childhoods there, because it, it it it's a lifetime to sort of get back to to what I think a, a lot of people are able to to reach. Um, it's it, it's a, it's an added extra struggle. The damage can last a lifetime. Oh, I think well, but if you're a child in there, absolutely. I mean, the adults talk about it even, but but if you're a child in there. Yeah, absolutely. One of the reasons why I resonated with your piece in Toronto Life was I was 12 years old and I ran away. I, I, I had a violent stepfather and I was a good student. I was a good athlete, um, but I ran away pretty much out of self-preservation. And I didn't get far, which was a good thing because a lot of really bad things can happen to a 12-year-old. But then the next year I was sent to a school called Shattuck St. James. And Shattuck was a military school for, it was a high school. And then St. James was for um, middle school kids. And, um, but we still had the same draconian things. I was sent there when I was uh, 13 years old. And although we weren't officially military, we, as I said, it was, it was very autocratic there. And we shot guns and all kinds of, we marched. I mean, we did a lot of stuff, um, even though we were in middle school. And that place was really violent. I think it might have been a good school at one point, um, but when I was going there, it was very, very sick. And, um, and it was tremendously violent. Um, the administration seemingly condoned violence between the kids. And there was always violence with a lot of the teachers, a lot of the teachers were violent too. So I was, I had a lot of anxiety there. I think a lot of kids had a lot of anxiety, but it was just one of those things where I'm, I'm gonna get through it. And, um, I was very good academically. Actually, I was first in my class and I was a very good hockey player. Um, there was this one guy who just didn't like me. Um, this is in Fairbolt, Minnesota. And his name was Leon and he was a Native American. And what this school did is they would go to the Native American reservations and they would get like the best athletes. Um, and, and, and these guys were like, I was 13 and I was still starting to develop. And, but these guys were like fully developed at 14 or 15. And um, Leon just did not like me. And we played on the same hockey team and we were on a breakaway. And I took the shot and he punched me out after the game because I took the shot. So when I read about the travails that you experienced with the violence and the light sessions. I mean, we, we didn't have something called light sessions, but, uh, but we still had a tremendous amount of violence. And how have you recovered from that violence that, uh, that you were subjected to as, as, a, as a child and adolescent? Yeah, it's a it's a mixed bag. The recovery. I'm I'm sorry about uh, the school that you went to. It's. Oh, that's uh, all right. It's that's part of me, man. That's you know. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been a pretty rough go, um, because uh, it, in my case, my you know, my self esteem was 
substantially damaged by this experience. So overcoming that uh, has proven to be pretty difficult. Um, you know, I did uh, obviously put in a lot of work to, you know, be a, I guess, moderately successful writer. And, uh, you know, just even in some, I mean, some things like as a young age, I would memorize poetry from quite a young age. And I would, it's like if you memorized a poem, it could be part of you and the cult people wouldn't know. And you could think about, I could think about it another time. So I hit the 500 poem memorized mark at a, a young age. And that's a kind of therapy. I did a lot of, uh, a lot of running. And I think that also, uh, has helped to a certain extent in terms of, of, of like relationships. I think it, it's, it's difficult, this kind of situation, um, you know, requires quite a bit of working through because there are trust issues, I think with a lot of former students. And so there's, there's, there's some problems. It's had a, it's had a lasting impact, uh, on my life. And I, I think, I mean, yeah, it was it's it was quite an uphill uphill struggle for for many years, you know, uh, for a variety yeah variety of reasons. But there is a second legal stage to this, so I probably won't go into that too much. Um, but yeah, overcoming overcoming this stuff has been very difficult. Yeah, very very difficult. I mean, I do you know. I, I think I have a pretty interesting life and I do hang out with some pretty interesting, interesting characters, but it, it, it took a while to get there. I certainly was uh, very late, late arriving. So, I mean, I, you, you seem to have done very well. I mean, you, 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 but you were at the school for one year. I was at uh, Shattuck St. James for one year, yes. So um, there wasn't a lot of irrevocable damage I have an interesting story. Um, Leon and I, uh, he lived right across the hall and he was, for some reason, he just didn't like me. And, um, and we would get into fights and he'd always win because he was like so much bigger than I was. And he was like a fully developed man. And I was a pubescent teenager. And, um, and I'd always, whenever I thought of him, whenever his image would kind of, uh, cascade into my through my thoughts I always have a, a great sense of antipathy towards Leon um, actually I thought about writing a movie called hitting Leon but I, I didn't know what um, <laughs> I've never written a movie before so I didn't but um, I'll never forget I was when I was going to college I used to go to this greasy spoon for breakfast and it was called Curly's and Curly's was right adjacent to a blood bank. And there were people, I believe that they went to the blood bank and got paid and then went to Curly's. I called them the blood bank intelligentsia because they knew everything about everything. And I'll never forget, I was eating breakfast there one morning and they were talking about everything. And um, this Native American went up to him and said, you guys don't know shit, shut up. And then the one of them responded, well, it's a free country. And the Native American guys said, uh, yeah, well, it's so free. I, you know, I'm going to kick your ass. So um, that kind of shut them up. But I was thinking to myself, this guy did not look like Leon, but I was thinking to myself, I wonder if that's how Leon has turned out. So I was walking down this thoroughfare in a lower socioeconomic part of Minneapolis. And I looked up and I saw a guy that looked like Leon. And I went up to him and I said, is your name Leon? And he goes, no, it's Bill. And, um, and I said, okay. And then I started to walk away. I got about 10 feet away from him. And um, he said, I've got a brother named Leon. And I said, did he go to Shattuck St. James? And he said, yes. I said, well, I went there with him. Why did I gave him my number. And then as soon as I got in the door, Leon called me. And Leon had nothing but love for me. He said, oh, it's so great, Nick. Uh, this is a miracle. This is a miracle. I, I love you. <laughs> you know, so, 
his remembrances of our relationship were very different than my remembrances. And um, so that night I went over to Leon's, he was living in the projects and life had really uh, taken its toll on him. He was relatively young, but uh, you, you could tell that uh, drinking and drugging had taken a pretty severe toll on him. So we went to this liquor store and I bought a bunch of booze and we got pretty hammered. And, um, and I was singing to myself throughout the course of us drinking, you know, this guy really kicked my ass a number of times. <laughs> and, and earlier that year, I'd actually played college football. So, and I'm 6'4", I was pretty pumped up. And, um, and there was a part of me that said, you know, maybe I should kick Leon's ass. And then, but then I realized, you know, life has kicked his ass. I don't have to do that. Um, whatever I could do to Leon, life has been much, much more difficult on him. And, um, and then we left that night. I, I never saw him again. We left that night and it was completely tabula rasa. Um, I had no more antipathy for Leon whatsoever. In fact, now I don't know if this is a cultural thing or it was just a drunk thing, but uh, he offered to have me spend the night with his wife. And, um, and I said, you know, Leon, I'm, no thanks. Um, I don't, I'm sure that was guilt. <laughs> It was, uh, that was very strange. Of all the people I've ever uh, met, no one said, do you want to spend the night with my wife? So, um, uh, and, it, and it didn't really, it wasn't something I wanted to do. So, um, how about you, um, other than poetry, is there other things in, in writing? Is there other things? Or, or have you seen people that you went to school with and have you been able to work through a relationship with them? Um, I, I, I have some contact with some of the, the, the people that uh, I went to Grenville with and some of the people I knew from the, the, you know, the mother branch of Community of Jesus cult. So, uh, uh, but I didn't have a sustained contact. Um, you know, it was, it's more of a recent thing, relatively recent, but um, I, I don't have quite any revel, re, sort of stories quite like that, but there is a second stage uh, to the legal proceedings. So probably gonna oh, pause on that for a little bit. So there were legal proceedings that started in 2007. And could you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it was a class action lawsuit and uh, it was about the abuses at Grenville. And, um, uh, you know, the, a lot of students, you know, felt there would be limited chance of success, but it, it's uh, just because they're so used to, uh, you know, the bad guys, like the bully winning. So uh, it, was, uh, it was incredible that it went to trial and it was wonderful to be in the courtroom. Uh, in particular, uh, there's a, a professor of psychology at U of T, who was brought in as uh, an expert witness. And uh, it, she was acknowledging um, the abuses to students at Grenville. And it, it was a well-attended trial. A lot of the students were, were crying. One, one student that I knew there, uh, you know, he was, he was raped when he was at Grenville. Uh, and it's the story of how he said this is a harrowing story, but he, he um, had to leave and, and then a lot of people, oh, some other people had to leave too. It, it, was, uh, it was a pretty emotional moment, but that was, a, that was like, I'd say the high point of the whole trial. I'll never forget that. And, you know, you could see a lot of people, there were people in, you know, handicapped and scooters and stuff because autoimmune disease with this type of emotional abuse, it really does affect the body. Uh, it's like the Bessel van der Kolk and the, the body keeps the score. You know, it's, uh, so it, it was, I don't have um, stories, I guess, quite like yours, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, I have other kinds of stories, but, um, but it, it's, uh, it's sad to look back on it. Other people talk about, you know, 
their past and stuff. And uh, I don't have much to look back on that's with, with a lot of happiness, but, but, uh, but uh, overcoming that to, uh, to be a, a moderately successful writer is, uh, is a, a bit of a, was a bit of a task, but uh, uh, you know, it was, yeah, I think it would have been, it would have, things would have been different for a lot of former, these former students had they had a normal, normal run at life. And the success rates have, have been quite poor. Um, but, you know, there's some, a few people, I think, uh, I know of like, I guess, two people who became doctors, they, but they were sort of coddled by the cult. But uh, really in terms of, of outcomes and lives, successful lives or achievements, so many uh, people just simply didn't achieve anything remotely close to their potentials. And uh, I think it's just very sad. It's very, very sad. And this is because of two, um, you know, two people were able to start a cult a very abusive cult, use this stuff that even another, the, the German cult leader said, don't do this on children, they do it anyway. And then they, then it's extended to a school and, and all of this damage, because these people have some crazy narcissistic disorder and they were able to, or whatever they had, and they're able to run wild and damage all these people. And, you know, you got to wonder how many generations down, it, it's just appalling, it's appalling. But uh, sorry, there were there were uh, thirteen hundred plaintiffs in that lawsuit, and was there any kind of bonding that you felt with the other plaintiffs, given that you'd been through the same hell together? Uh, th there's some, yeah. There, there's there's some, and there's uh, you know there are conscious attempts to you know break free of that stuff. But I I think um, I mean I always call it a you know I always call it a cult and you know and I think that really helps some people use that kind of the kind of new speak language because it's like a different kind of vocabulary that you use in the cult and I, I don't think that's helpful for uh, recovery of a lot of the former students but it, you know there's different degrees of of therapies that different you know students have have had um but you know, there's some of that, but I, I don't think it's anything close to what uh, people in a in what would have been a a, a more of a typical or a, a, an ordinary schooling situation, relatively comparable for the time. I think that there's quite a dramatic difference between the two. I mean, it's it's a it's an authentic cult. <laughs> The judge uh, definitely sided with the 1300 plaintiffs. This is what she said. Granville knowingly created an abusive, authoritarian and rigid culture which exploited and controlled developing adolescents who were placed in its care. I have concluded that the evidence of maltreatment and the varieties of abuse perpetrated on students' bodies and minds in the name of the community of Jesus were class-wide and decades-wide. So after that judge listened to the case, she definitely sided with the plaintiffs. She realized how much abuse that they had taken at that school and in that cult. And, and then it was upheld on appeal, which is just wonderful. Just wonderful that, uh, you know, that, that the, uh, you know, the, the school principal and uh, Charles Farnsworth's son, uh, Don Farnsworth, would go on the stand and lie, just outright lie, is incredible. It's it's uh, it's always incredible. But I guess that that happens every day. But it, when it happens to you, and you know the extent of it, it's it's always shocking. I mean, it's always shocking. So you realized that you were hooked. I mean, you, you emancipated yourself as soon as you could emancipate yourself, I believe, and, and, and got out of the cult. Yeah. And, and they, how, how old were you at that point? Uh, well, I mean, it, it, the, the break, 
I mean, I was a sort of late teenager, but the break was, uh, it was strange because Kay and Judy would, would actually call me up. You know, the, the mothers would the mothers call me up and, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty crazy, uh, that they would, would do that, but you know, and why wasn't it God's will? Everything was God's will. And they somehow knew God's will. Like these two housewives somehow know the will of God, <laughs> you know, just like, you know, I, I think of Apuleius's funny line that, uh, if donkeys had gods, God, they'd be in the shape of donkeys, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of funny, but, uh, yeah, I, I, getting away from this, I mean, I had a period of homelessness. Um, you know, I, I had a pretty rough go, rough go of it. Um, but, you know, I always had, uh, always had poetry and I was always reading to a certain extent. I mean, obviously the homeless period, you can't do a lot of that, a lot of reading. But, but um, you know, I, I guess, you know, we're pretty resilient as humans. I mean, but, uh, but the suicide rate from the school uh, alone appears to be something like 10%. It's very, very high. I mean, life expectancy is a lot lower, I think, than you're gonna get in normal societies. So, I mean, there's, there's all these other uh, stresses as well. And sort of finding my sense of self like so many other former students, I think was a very, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing. It's a very difficult thing. And, and uh, I found myself behind as so many former students did or, and, or children from who, who grew up as children in the community of Jesus cult, uh, the, the main branch, like in, you know, in Cape Cod, like they, they uh, it's hard. It's hard. It's like, you're always, you're always somehow behind. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's diff difficult to overcome. There's varying degrees of this. People, I mean, even people who you'd think who, you know, wouldn't be too harmed, they're, they're, they, it still dramatically affects them years later, years and years later. Like now, it's, uh, you know, what was done is, was incredibly unjust. And, and uh, you know, something should be done for the, 40 to 50 children that are in the community of Jesus cult today. Like they, they, something should be done for these children. I, I was just like any of those children, you know, and sometimes it takes an atheist to do something a Christian should have done a long time ago. So that kind of leads to my next question. Have you, uh, have you tried any metaphysical exploration after leaving um, that cult or have you just stayed an atheist? Well, you know, I, I've done a, uh, I, I would say a, a, an obsessive research, you know, Christianity and of, uh, the other Abrahamic religions. And of course, uh, you know, Buddhism is always an appealing thing to uh, learn about, but uh, I'm, I'm, pretty much allergic to religion for the most part. I mean, or the, the tyranny of organized religion is that it claims God as its property. So, uh, you know, this, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that if somebody can be excluded is gonna be excluded, well, I don't, you know, I don't want a part of that. But uh, uh, I, I did go down that, and, and in particular, what I found very helpful was Northrop Fry's uh, the Great Code, where he he takes Jean Baptiste Vico's uh, stages of history, and he kind of well kind of redoes it, it's a wholesale borrowing, let's say, you know, and he has the stages of history and use of language, and and it's it's remarkable at how our imaginations parallel uh, usage of language, like the hieroglyphic language in in Homer is described, where sky is sky. The, Dawn, you know, it's a personified goddess, and it's all it, it's elemental, you know, Bronze Age stuff, and um, and and that applies to language in the hieratic, you know, the dialogues, you know, would be you know the aristocratic age, you know, that sort of 
Attic Greece, classical Greece period, and then the, and the Demotic, the period following of the, the people and, and the usage of language and also our relationship to poetry. But you, you can really, in looking at this, you can get a good grasp of, of religious states and how language ties in to how we would, we would relate to uh, the, these god essences or elements. And it's a psychological uh, sort of mirroring almost of our of ourselves use of language and that type of uh, these these various stages i think it's a fantastic book if someone doesn't want to read that they can read the double vision there's a wonderful quotes from william blake in that but uh i'll spare you the blake william blake was uh was actually quite the theist as i understand um i was open-ended theist yeah i was into his poetry at one point it was at uh before I went to Shattuck St. James, I had not had a lot of re religion in my life. Um, I really hadn't given much thought to God. <clears throat> and at Shattuck St. James, we had to hit the chapel twice a week, on Sunday and then on Wednesday. And what we saw, what I saw, I mean, the two primary texts at Shattuck at least for St. James. I mean, the first text that we had to read was Lord of the Flies. I mean, they, they gave us to that, they gave us that immediately. And then there was the Bible. So there was the Bible and Lord of the Flies. And I just completely disconnected from religion at that point. Um, I did start to give it some thought. And I thought, if this is religion, I, I want out. And, and actually that uh, school was an Episcopalian school, like like the cult. And to this day, when I meet Episcopalians, I, I ask them if they believe in God. But another thing that what was interesting about your story, um, I did do, I, I got into metaphysical exploration. It, it's just recently come out that uh, Aaron Rodgers, the Green Bay Packers uh, great quarterback, did ayahuasca in South America. It's a hallucinogen. And he said that it enabled him to become the most valuable player uh, the following year that it opened up things. Well, I got into hallucinogenic um, experimentation when I was 15 and it opened up a world to me that otherwise wouldn't have been open. And I started reading Eastern philosophy when I was 15. Now, the only way, given my background, the only way I'm reading Eastern philosophy is with hallucinogens. Um, and then I ultimately, I mean, even though the Beatles had Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi, I, you know, I just said nothing to, to do with religion. But then I did embrace Eastern uh, thought. And I liked, uh, uh, there's something about pantheism that appealed to me. And as a teenager, I went and lived with an Indian guru, a genuine Indian guru. His name was the Holiness, the Venerable Sri, Sri Swami Rama. And I'll never forget um, he, he was an, uh, ostensibly an enlightened being. And um, I'll never forget, I was talking to him one day and I could have swore I smelled cigarettes on his breath. Now here's an enlightened being. He, he can't possibly be smoking cigarettes. So I went to someone who lives on the ashram. We've been there a while. And I said, you know, man, I, I could have swore I smelled cigarettes on Swami's breath. And he said to me, yeah, well, this is how it works. He has to have one vice to keep himself tethered to this plane of reality so he can teach us. And um, I cogitated on that and it did not make a lot of sense, but I was learning a lot. I mean, it was living there was kind of like a doctoral uh, exposure to Eastern religion and Eastern philosophy. And then I found out that he was having sex with the girls on the ashram, which he shouldn't have been because he was a swami, which means that he was supposed to be celibate. And then I found out that he was embezzling money from one of his more affluent initiates. And I, and I thought to myself, man, that guy's really got to be spiritually advanced if he has to do all that just to keep on this plane of reality to teach us. So um, I left that experience very bitter. And... Um, but I continued metaphysical exploration after that. And I, I didn't give up on it, but I learned a lot on that ashram. And the, 
the going away message was that no one person has all the answers. And I'm really glad that, um, that I got that at, at, a, at a very young age, that I learned that at a very young age. How old were you? I was 19 years old when I uh, went and lived on the ashram. And I was there for, I think, seven or eight months. Um, the thing about that particular ashram, Swami Rama um, went to the Manager Foundation in Topeka, Kansas, which uh, looks at paranormal activity. And he was able to stop his heart at will. He was able to change the temperatures uh, of his body at will. And he was able to produce alpha and beta, and I think gamma brainwaves at will. And these scientists were completely blown away by these cities or these abilities that he had. And so it was a cult of intellectuals, but they needed big guys like me to build stuff. So I was assimilated and, um, and I went to, I helped to build a bookstore in New York City for him. And that's when I really found out how dirty he was. And I told some of his more affluent initiates uh, about his lower chakra problems. And um, it got back to him and he threatened my life. He said, get out of that city in 12 hours or else. I, I did not take him seriously at that point. And I have not taken him seriously since. Um, and in fact, I did stay in New York a while. So, um, but it was, it was a good learning experience. But as I said, I left with some bitterness, um, not nearly the bitterness that I left uh, Shattuck St. James with. Um, and yourself, have you been able to assuage the bitterness that you felt? Well, in, you know, in, um, you know, box cantata 146, you know, it's like time stands still and there's a brief moment of eternity. We forget about everything. But I think it's, it's, it's always this on tap thing. It's this on tap thing. It's this, it's this dark shadow lurking. This cult has seems to have given me this for life. And, um, you know, it, certain, um, certain, certain things, keep it away for for bits of time but uh, I mean but you know everyone has we all have something what's the line in Catullus Every, everyone has something on their in their back you know we, we can't see what we're carrying in the bag we carry on our backs but uh, you know I yeah I uh, yeah I would I I think there are you know there are times where it seems less bad and other times it comes back. But uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's something I think a lot of, you know, I, I just think of the children in, in the, you know, the cult today and just think, well, you know, like a lot of pain could be stopped by having, having them monitored. Why can't the state of Massachusetts monitor the children in there? Why, you know, why can't they do that? Why, you know, why is this religious freedom allowing them to homeschool? It would appears to be, it appears to be almost all of the children. I mean, what chance will they have in life? Like, uh, be nice. It'd be nice to do something uh, for those, those children. It'd be nice to, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm intending on publishing again um so yeah we'll see we'll see what happens there well as i said when i started this podcast i was uh the cult that raised me your article in toronto life resonated with me deeply because of my personal experiences and i'm so glad that you've decided to come on the nick bryant podcast are there any closing thoughts that you can think of that you'd like to leave with us that we haven't talked about? Oh yeah, L'Esprit L'Escalier, you know, you think of the something witty to say as you're walking down the staircase after it's over. I think that's Dieter Rogan. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's the, the funny Robert Lowell? Um, my brain's economizing so prodigally, I think I've suffered theft. No, I'm drawing a blank, but I, I just think, well, you know, I, um, 
you know, what, what would help one person, maybe it wouldn't help another, but maybe, uh, you know, there's probably a variety of ways that people can be helped through various difficult things. And uh, I would just hope that people in those situations would just never give up and keep trying like the, like the, the funny, uh, and famous, uh, Churchill speech, never give up, never give up. Never give up. And then there's always uh, Nietzsche, um, what doesn't kill you makes you strong. And there's, oh, yeah. and there's a, a lesser philosopher, his name is Nick Bryant. And he said, what doesn't kill you might make you stronger, but it's gonna hurt like hell. <laughs> but I'm so yeah. glad that you came on the podcast and um, have yourself a wonderful day, Owen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And uh, I just, yeah, on the way out the door, uh, your, your, your writing is, uh, I mean, you're very well, very, very well crafted. Just looking at it. I mean, you, you could have been a fiction writer had you, had you chosen to go that route and you would have done very well. Well, the fat lady has yet to sing, or maybe I should say the mothers have yet to sing. <laughs> uh, yes. Take care, man. Take care.